Morning, everyone. Um, oh, good to see the numbers going up quite quick already. Morning, Tanishka. Good to see you online. So we're looking at Ecology Part 2 today. If you remember last week, we looked at, um, I suppose, starting to look at some of the key words. And we said this particular unit especially, uh, there's lots of key words. And it's, it can often be a lot more writing with the ecology topics because it can be quite a descriptive version of the science. But we can still get away with writing less if we know all the key words. So if you haven't watched part one, watch it at some point uh, fairly soon. Morning, Nico. Morning, Ruby. Good to see you online. Uh, because we looked at what the words ecosystem, we looked at habitat, we looked at population, community. Uh, we use these terms abiotic and biotic, and we spoke about biodiversity. And I think we finished looking at food webs. And what we were saying is actually, by knowing the definitions of these key words, we can still get away with writing bullet points in the exam questions, so we don't have to waffle, we don't have to write huge amounts of text. So if you're not sure, go back, have another look, make some revision cards up and test yourself on those keywords. And then if you're trying to do any of the exam questions, and I've got some exam questions I'm going to post after this lesson. Morning, Michael. Um, not as compulsory work, because that's the Seneca and that's these lessons, but more to give you a go at trying to use some of the terminology we're looking at at the moment. So let's make a start. Um, we finished then last lesson, and let me just bring drop in the same. Bear with me. We'll just drop in exactly the same food web that we finished with. Um, I think it was the same food web. It might be a different one. Anyway, I'm going to drop in a food web because I want to use it, and uh, it's one I quite like. Here we go. So again. Thank you to WikiHow, because I really like this. There we go. And I like this one because it's got the bacteria at the top as well, which most food webs don't have. Most food webs end with the apex predator. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to put in some keywords as we're going through, because I think it's really important when looking at food webs that we can use the correct keywords. I'm not going to write down the definitions, I'm just going to list them and talk through them. And one of the things that's worth you doing is trying to get the definitions down. And maybe at some point in the very... Morning, Lily. Good to see you online. Um, more, maybe at some point in the future, go through, re-watch the video again, and make sure you've got all of these definitions down as you're going through. So we started off last lesson, and we started off saying that actually these plants down the bottom, these are our producers. So producers are any sort of organism that can synthesize its own molecules, its own food products. Now that's not saying it can make them from just, well, out of nothing. I nearly said thin air, but actually they are making it from thin air. Um, this is using the sort of molecules around them, and then they're using the sun's energy or another energy source to do chemical reactions to rebuild them back up into different molecules. So these are the sort of species that are going to be making their own glucose. They're going to be making starch. They're going to be making cellulose, proteins. They're going to be making fats and different fibres. And they're going to be building them up out of carbon dioxide, out of water, out of the nitrates that they can get from the soils. It may be combining them with different minerals. But it's going to be basically using the sun's energy to build these molecules into the molecules that they need. Okay, So they are literally producing it from thin air but using the sun's energy or another energy source. We then get down to the consumers. So these are, morning Jack, these are the animals which eat either the plants or other animals. And we can sort of separate them into sort of different groups. We've got sort of our primary, we've got secondary, and we've got our tertiary consumers. Morning Amy, tertiary consumers. So. The sort of first line, I suppose, with um, probably the addition of the rabbit as well, these would be our primary consumers because these are the ones that are eating the plants. The next sort of row of predators then, these would be our secondary consumers and then so on. We can go up to our tertiary and in some cases up to our sort of quaternary um, consumers as well. So our consumers. Now, we should be sort of fairly happy using prey and predators. Can't spell. 
What I would say is make sure you're happy with the term apex predator. A lot of students, when I've been through this with them before, they're quite happy that the apex predator um, is at the top of the food web or the food chain. But when I've shown them this particular food web, they've actually put the bacteria down as the apex predator. And this is a bit of a sort of weird one to think about because the bacteria in most cases don't actually kill the animal underneath. So because they're not killing, not actively hunting, they're not actually a predator themselves. So yes, they're above them in the food web and the food chain, but they wouldn't be considered the apex predator. And the other reason why I like this particular food web is the fact that actually a lot of students, they'll put down um, the rattlesnake because it's the way the food web's drawn is on the same level. But if you notice, there's actually an arrow going from the rattlesnake to this particular hawk. So the only apex predator in this case, and I'll just change this to red so we can see, is this one. Okay, so that's the only predator that's right at the top of the food chain. Now, I don't need to go through predators and prey too much, in too much more detail than that, so make sure you've got those down. But as we carry on looking our way through, uh, we spoke last week about, or sorry, last week on Monday, and we mentioned carnivores, and I think everyone's happy that carnivores eat meat. We've got herbivores, which are veggies, so they're the ones that only eat vegetables. Um, possibly, in a lot of cases, probably better to call them vegans, but no, they're the ones that only eat vegetables or plant-based material. We've got the omnivores, which will eat both. And then I put another category in, which some of you had not heard of before, which was our detroitivores. And what we said was this word sort of vores means to eat. And the sort of Detroit in front of it is basically detritus um, debris. It's the dead and decaying material. So we've got things that have di died and they're gradually being broken down. And the sort of animals that goes into this category are things like worms. Uh, we could have maggots. Crabs actually goes into this one as well. Um, although they will also eat other things as well. But basically it's the sort of living non-micro um, non microbe uh, organisms that will eat the dead and the decaying matter that, is, um, that they'll find. So we've got that word down there. So that might be a new keyword if you haven't come across it before. So you can add these to the keywords that we looked at last time. Um, there's one more as well, which are our decomposers. And the decomposers are the microorganisms. So when we're looking at this particular food web, the only decomposer that we've really got on here is going to be the bacteria. So these are our decomposers. Um, and there's probably not a lot in the way of uh, detritivores on there. So we need to just sort of make sure that we're happy with those. Uh, and we're going to bring them in a bit later on. When we start looking at things like the carbon cycle, then we're going to be using these words. We're going to be bringing them in a lot more as well. So they're not words that we should, that are fairly standalone. Some of these are actually a little bit more common English than some of the other science words we come across. So make sure you get the definitions right and don't be afraid of trying to use them. In the long run, it means you're going to be using, doing less writing and you're probably going to be getting more marks because it's actually more descriptive by doing less by using these keywords. Okay, so don't be afraid of trying to use these in your answers. All right, let's just go across this way for a change. Normally go down, let's just go over this way. So when we start looking at these creatures, we need to sort of think about the adaptations. Uh, let me go back to black for a minute. Now, the, again, the term adaptations isn't new. It's a term that comes up in Key Stage 1 and 2. Uh, a lot of people can actually write down how animals are different what i would say with this is make sure that you can actually put down not just how different species are different but how those differences make them better at living in their particular ecosystem so if you remember the other day we looked at these two terms abiotic um, and biotic we said that the abiotic was the non-living factors so we're looking at ph we're looking at temperature we're looking at water um, basically anything that's non-living and we said we've got the biotic factors which would be the predators, be the prey it would be the microorganisms and anything that was living so the adaptations it, 
will be the particular features that help the animals live in the conditions dictated by these. So in other words, we're looking at the conditions for the ecosystem or the habitat they live in. So what we're trying to do is we're actually looking at taking a particular species that maybe we know fairly well and we can describe, but we're now trying to add in some extra details that brings it up to GCSC and that brings it up to a more advanced level. So I'm going to give you an example, and I'm going to give you an example of an animal, and then I'm probably going to do a plant as well. And then we're going to look at another category of species, which a lot of people don't tend to see quite so much. Um, but you can do a lot of bit, quite a bit of research around these later on. So let's just go for something simple like a polar bear. Now, what I'm going to do is I think the easiest way of doing this one, and this is how I would do it in the exam as well, I would get some additional paper or I do it on the exam paper if there's enough room. And if we had to explain this, and maybe it was a six marker, as I've said to you the last few times, and for some of you, I think it's it's really difficult to sort of try and change your mindset to think this way. But actually planning your answers out and then only bullet pointing means we don't waffle. So with the polar bear, we need to think about what are the differences from this particular polar bear, from other mammals and from other bears. So for starters, their skin is black. Okay, and we'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Their fur is transparent and hollow. Now, yes, you're going to turn around and go, no, no, they're white. And they are white, or well, they look white. Uh, actually, let's put this down as two separate ones. But the reason they look white is because a lot of the light as it goes through um, gets refracted, gets diffracted, and gets reflected back to us. Um, but if you take the individual hairs and you look at them under a microscope, they're actually hollow and you can see through them. And again, we'll look at why that's important in a moment. Um, most people can talk about the claws um, and the teeth. We need to put down the fact they appear white. They've got big feet. We'll talk about why that's important in a minute as well. So we've got these features for the moment. Um, we can also talk about, uh, you can maybe talk about fat stores. Because actually they often have quite large fat stores. But then a lot of the animals in the Arctic do as well. So let's just now go through and try and work out why each of these are important. We know the claws and the teeth are for hunting. They're probably for digging as well. So we've got hunting, or catching prey. So that's for the food. Uh, morning, Olivia. White again. This one's a fairly, hopefully, a fairly obvious one because that's going to be camouflage. Morning, Raoul. Good to see you online. Um, that's going to be camouflage. So that's going to try and help them again catch food uh, because at the end of the day, they're... Morning, Grace. Yeah, spot on, Grace. Um, so the black skin, I'll come over to this one now then. This is for absorbing sun's energy, absorbing heat. And the same thing as the hollow fur. So this reduces heat loss. And again, we're going to try and bring in some extra terminology here. Reduces heat loss by conduction and convection. Uh, if you're not sure what those two words mean, have a look at the physics video I've done. I think it's physics one is energy. So I've done the video on that. So it's well worth going back through and having a look. Uh, transparent lets the energy, lets the heat, sorry, lets the light in. In this case, we're particularly interested in the infrared because that's the one that's going to heat them up. Fat stores, because it's cold. <laughs> and actually that's going to be the energy source for when they go into hibernation. Or actually if they've got offspring, they may be feeding it for a while. They may not be able to hunt as much. And finally, we've got the big feet to stop the sinking. So, yeah, stop sinking into the snow. Because what it does is it increases the surface area in the same way that snowshoes and skis do. So we've got these ideas down as well. So when we're looking at different animals, we really need to try and make sure that we can 
actually go through, identify what the feature is, but then explain why that feature is important. How is that adaptation helping that animal survive in that particular environment? We can link in the biotic and the abiotic features if we need to, but those are the sorts of things we need to be putting down. And we still only need to put down bullet points. We don't need to be writing huge essays on this one. So for a six mark question, if it's asking for an explain, I would probably only need to put down three or four bullet points as long as I've explained it. Because each bullet point is going to give me two marks if I've put down what the adaptation is and then how it helps it survive, depending on what the question's asking you to do. So by doing this, again, three, four bullet points for a six mark question is brilliant. And then spending a 30 seconds or so just going through and brainstorming these particular ideas is going to save me a lot of time in the long run. We can then go and have a look. And again, I'm going to go for something fairly simple that everybody knows about. We're going to talk about the cacti. But we, you could do this exercise for any species. If you want the practice for doing this one, just go through, um, identify an animal if you want to do it, choose an animal that's really obscure, like the platypus, and then go through and research the differences on it. Because the platypus is just bonkers. I mean, they're brilliant. Um, I've seen them in Australia, not in the wild, unfortunately, um, in a zoo. And you look at them, and when you've got the duck bill, you've got the webbed feet, and they've got a poisonous spur on their feet, but then they're also covered in fur. So you've got features of birds, features of animals. They lay eggs, but they actually suck all their young on milk, the same as mammals do. So they're amazing. So go through and have a look, and then try and figure out how do those adaptations help it survive. Realistically, in the exam, as long as your answer is actually relatively sensible, you're going to get the marks for that point. So for the cacti, we can have a look at the spikes. We can have a look at the lack of leaves as well. We've got the large root system. For some of them, we've got the large stem. Now, I'm not an expert on cacti, so I'm gonna leave it there for a minute. This can often be a store. I'm going to put a store of water. That water is often not pure. There's not that many cacti that you can do what they do in the film, where you can go along and um, tap the cacti and get the water out. There are some, but there's also some that the sap that's producing them is highly toxic and will, uh, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you very, very unwell. But there is some that you can tap directly for the water. So it's just worth being aware of that one. Some vines do the same thing. So the spikes as well, we know is protection. But also, when we have a look at some of these, in some cases, the spikes are actually what were the leaves. And what these do is they reduce um, the surface area. So we're going to have less stomata, which means we've got less water loss by transpiration. Um, so we have looked at transpiration. We looked at it in biology one and two. So again, if it's one of those terms you're looking at going, what does that mean? Go back, have a look at the videos, see how it's linked. Um, the large root system is to increase the water uptake. Now, some cacti, not all of them, but some cacti, when you look at the root systems for them, uh, they're actually quite close to the surface and they can spread out up to a kilometre sort of in different directions. And that's because if you think about when the temperature drops at night in the desert, we go below the dew point, actually you get a small amount of moisture covering the surface, but it is only a small amount. So the larger that root system can be, the more of that moisture can be taken up by the cacti. So they can be very, very large, and they can be very, very close to the system as well. So that's just two examples, just zoom out for a minute, that's just two examples of different species that we should know about, that we can then go through and we can have a look at and we can look at the adaptations, but more importantly, how those adaptations help it survive. Now, there's not, actually, let's just go down here. There's another category of species that's worth having a look at. And what I would suggest you do at some point, just because some of these are properly, properly bonkers and really quite cool, is go onto Google and type in extremophile. Now here, most of these that have come up with are the ultimate extremophile, and that's the tardigrades. And these are properly cool. Properly, properly cool. So the tardigrades can actually survive in space. They can survive almost anything that we throw at them. 
they are virtually impossible to kill. Um, they're very, very tiny. They're very, very microscopic. But if you try to dehydrate them and remove all the water, which kills almost everything else, they just shrivel up and they turn, they go inactive. Um, as soon as you put them back in water again, they rehydrate and they carry on moving around. Uh, they can cope with very cold. They can cope with very hot. Um, I'm pretty sure I've read somewhere they can cope with high amounts of radiation as well. So these little tardigrades here are absolutely amazing. Um, and under a microscope, I actually think they look quite cute. But they do. So these things are properly, properly amazing. So this is one type of extremophile. But if you start going through and having a look, some of the extremophiles um, are bacteria. In fact, a lot of them are bacteria because they've actually found some of the sulfur springs in parts of the world where you have very high temperatures and the water is actually sulfuric acid because of the sulfur that's being released into it from underground. So most things would die almost straight away. But they found bacteria that have been thriving in these areas. Um, if you start looking, so here we go. This is one of the thermophiles. So this is one of the hot springs that we would find um, in America. It's way too hot for any of us to survive, but they do find bacteria living there. Um, if you go to some of the deep sort of areas of the ocean where most things would get properly crushed, actually, there are organisms down there that would survive quite comfortably. And there are organisms. And we're talking about fish, we're talking about squid, we're talking about microorganisms. Whereas we've only in the last couple of years been able to investigate and start exploring because we've never been able to build anything that's been strong enough to actually withstand the sheer pressure that's down there. But there are some organisms that are surviving and are actually flourishing down there. Trying to study them is quite difficult because we can't actually bring them back up out of the water again because they're so used to dealing with the, the vast amounts of pressure. The only way that you can actually have um, that you can survive that down there because a lot of them aren't actually producing a shell a lot of them will have the same internal pressure as the external pressure so if you try to bring them back up out if you remember back to when we've done forces as the pressure on the outside decreases if you come up too quickly the pressure inside will cause them to explode so we can't actually bring them up to study them we can only study them in their environment but there's lots and lots of these extremophiles depending on where you go where you look and I thoroughly recommend at some point just going through and researching some of these, looking at their adaptations, looking at the conditions. Uh, because these are the sorts of things that I can see an exam board one day, particularly an exam on this board, starts putting one of these in. And this will be the next question that students go, well, you've never taught us about. And actually, that's probably true. But then you don't need to know it if you can apply your knowledge of adaptation and application of that. OK. Now. Let's just go back up. And I think I've got an exam question on here somewhere on this one. These are the sorts of questions that we may get. And again, this is the sort of thing that students go, you haven't ever taught us about this. And these questions I'm going to be putting online later on. Um, as I said at the start, I'm not going to set it as a compulsory, you must do this work. I'm going to do it for some questions so that you can have a go and practice some of the content I'm going through now. So... I've had lots of students have been sort of caught out by this as we go through. We've got two types of seaweed. This one here has these little bladders that are filled with air. And what they're trying to say is why is it that that is an advantage for where it lives? If you think about what plants need, one of the key thing is going to be light. So as they get covered with water, the deeper the water is above them, the less light they're going to get. But if we can put these little tiny bladders filled with air in, then what happens then is the plants are going to float, which means they're going to be closer to the surface, so they're going to be getting more sunlight so that photosynthesis can happen faster. So we've got this idea of growing more quickly. And if you look at the mark scheme, that's exactly what we've got. We've got get more light because it's near the surface, increase photosynthesis, um, which is then going to increase the biomass because we're producing more glucose and more starch. Bear in mind this is a grade two question, which means it can appear on foundation and higher level questions. Um, this is another one. Again, we couldn't teach you about every species on the planet. So what we need to do is whenever they give us a question about a species that we may not have seen before, we need to try and apply the information they've given us 
to some common sense and to the science knowledge that we already have. So we've got this idea of anglerfish and they've got this law. So let's just read the question. Anglerfish lives at depths of over a thousand meters. Um, in clear water, sunlight doesn't reach more than 100 metres. There is no light where they live. That's the sort of conclusion I'm making from what it said. Many anglerfish have these transparent lures containing a high concentration of bioluminescent bacteria. In other words, it glows. Bioluminescent um, is a bacteria that glows in the dark, produces light. So, and it produces light through a chemical reaction. Suggest an advantage. Well, we can start thinking through that, actually. This word law here means it's going to attract other species. So it's going to sit there glowing in the dark and attracting its prey to it. So it doesn't even need to go and find them. So let's just have a quick look at what the mark scheme's saying. Uh, it could say it lets it see, but it's going to attract its prey. And I think this is the one that I would go with. Um, they're also saying that it's going to attract mates, although it might attract predators as well. But we're going to attract its prey to get more food um, and they've got down here lets it see to avoid being eaten but it's only two marks so we only actually need to put down one or two of these points so I would literally for me attract its prey to get more food two marks two bullet points move on to the next question okay let's go back turn that off so that you can see Right, so don't be afraid of going through looking at these adaptations. Oh, let's turn it back on again. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> so the next part of when we're looking at this then is bit combining food webs and food chains. I think into uh, pyramids. So we're going to look at pyramids of biomass and we're going to look at pyramids of numbers next. Some of you will have done this before. Some of you won't. So hopefully it's going to be a recap. We're going to look at why pyramids of biomass are often more accurate than pyramids of numbers. So let's just have a quick look. Let's choose. Let's make up a food chain for a minute. We're not going for a food web. We're going to go for a fairly simple food chain. Let's just say we've got, I don't know why I'm going with oak tree, but a tree will do. On that oak tree, we have got... I can never remember if it's caterpillars or caterpillars. We've got some caterpillars. Let's just say we've got some sparrows. And then I'm going to put a sparrow hawk in here. So this is just a basic food chain that I'm making up on the spot. And I'm going to make up some numbers as well. It doesn't matter at this point whether the numbers are absolutely accurate. But it's going to give us a fairly good idea. So if we have the numbers in here, so this will be our population. And remember, if we're using another keyword, the combined population of all of these would be our community. So the community would be the population of each of these in this particular ecosystem or micro ecosystem as we're looking at it. So let's say we've got one oak tree. On that one oak tree, we're going to have I don't know, let's just say 10,000 caterpillars. It could be more, it could be less, it doesn't really matter. I'm doing this as an exercise that you can do at home to practice some of these skills. We're then going to have 50 sparrows. That's a five there. And then after that, we're probably only going to have one sparrow hawk. Now, if you were to produce a pyramid of numbers for this one, it would look something like this. And I'm not going to do it to scale, but it's going to give you a rough idea of the sort of thing that we can do. Apologies for those of you that are now cringing. This doesn't quite line up. Right, let me just see if I can move that a little bit more. Okay, done quite roughly, but that will give you the idea. So we've got our oak tree. We've got our caterpillar. I still don't know if that's here. I'm going to have to have a look in a minute. Sparrows. And our sparrow hawk. 
Now, we can see that actually it's not really much of a pyramid. And usually when we're looking at these, you're going, but yeah, we normally get those pyramids. And this does happen. And there's all sorts of things. I'm going to show you a different one in a minute as well, um, which doesn't give us the nice typical pyramid, which makes everybody happy and comfortable. However, so this is our pyramid of numbers. But we can also do a pyramid of biomass. And a pyramid of biomass always, 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 if I actually select the right one, does I forget the correct letter on it? A is an R. Okay. Pyramid of biomass will always look. like that okay so again we've got our tree we've got our caterpillar we've got our sparrow and we've got our sparrow hawk okay so this is a pyramid of biomass Now, you're probably, if you've got any sense looking at this, going, yeah, why is this useful? So the pyramid of biomass is more useful to us than the pyramid of numbers. And the reason being, it's showing us how much of the biological matter, which is also almost equivalent to the energy that's been, that's been transferred, that goes from one chain to another. Now, the sort of questions that may come up in the exam they may start talking about why is it that we've actually got this amount that's wasted at each level. Okay, and it does always do this because if you ever have a pyramid of biomass that doesn't equal, that doesn't look like your typical pyramid, that will mean that actually there's not enough energy to sustain the level above it and there's going to be lots of organisms dying. So this here is going to be lost through... So not all of the trees eaten. So not all is consumed. We'll use our keyword for consumer. Not all is consumed. We're going to say that energy is used uh, for respiration. If it's one of the animals, we can be saying that energy is used for movement. It could be reproduction. Um, it could be keeping warm. We could be putting down chemical reactions. And actually, some of the matter is actually excreted out as well. So straight away, by looking at the size of the bars, we can start seeing how much of the material that goes from one part of the food chain to the other is either wasted or not eaten, or it's being used for other things. Okay, so we always end up with a pyramid of biomass that looks like this. Now, if I just bring up another example of an exam question that's linked on this. So, again, this is a different food chain. They've given us one here. They've given us the population counts. And they've actually given us the biomass here. So this is the biomass of the whole of the population. Now, it's probably worth noting just for a moment... Now, there's two types of biomass. Sorry, I've got to stop doing that. Two types of biomass. We have dry biomass and we have wet biomass. And there's advantages and disadvantages to each of these. The dry biomass would mean I would have to collect all of the organisms of a certain population, kill them and evaporate them so there's no water left, so we are literally just looking at the dry biomass involved in that population. Now the advantage of this would be that we're only looking at the matter. We're not looking at the fluctuation of water levels. Um, you can think that for an animal, it's going to change. Every time that it has a drink or it urinates, the wet biomass is going to change. Whereas the dry biomass doesn't. The disadvantage is we actually end up with the destruction of this entire population of a particular um, level of 
this um, pyramid or food web. The wet biomass then, yes, it's not as accurate because actually the levels can fluctuate, but we don't have to kill any species in order to do it. So it's worth being aware of each of those. Um, I'm just going to bring another terminology in here. Each stage, and I'm just trying to think of the best way, oh, there it is. each level of our pyramid we call a trophic level. Because I almost used that word then um, to describe this, whereas I hadn't actually told you what it means yet. So we're looking at a trophic level. So as we go up the trophic levels, energy and biomass is not all transferred or it is used for other things. When we're looking at pyramids of biomass, we generally will use the wet biomass rather than the dry. Because yes, it's less accurate, but it doesn't involve killing off entire populations. Now, let me just go back to my other screen. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Lily, I've just realised that. <laughs> I'll go through it again. All I've said was that in our terms of our pyramid of biomass, then we've got dry and we've got wet. I've done it again. It's because I hit the space button to move. It's one of the shortcut keys for the whiteboard. And I do it before I actually select the whiteboard. So we've got the dry pyramid. Of, sorry, dry biomass, wet biomass. And what I did over here was the trophic level is each stage of the food chain. In other words, each section of the pyramid. If I go up to my food chain, each of these would be a trophic level. Okay. Sorry about that. Right. Go back to this again. So... We've got first trophic level is our seaweed. This is our producer. The limpet is then going to be our herbivore. The crab then is going to be the first carnivore. It could if the limpet was dead, because remember we said that crabs can also be detroitivores. And then our gull in this particular case is the apex predator. When we start looking at the numbers, we've got the population numbers. And this population number would actually look very similar to that first pyramid of numbers that I put in place. Um, not identical, but very, very similar. Where we start off small, and then we get bigger, and then we gradually get smaller again. Now, in terms of the pyramid of biomass, they're using the data to calculate the biomass of the gold population. So straight away, we should look at the fact that we've got two gulls. Each one of them is 900. So my figure for here is going to be 1,800 grams and it has to be less than 9,000 otherwise things are going to die and it then wants you to draw the pyramid of biomass so you're literally going to produce a diagram like I did before in here and then you're going to label it the pyramid sorry the biomass of the crab population is much less than the pyramid of the limpet population suggests why now if I go back to my other screen that's basically what I've said here so not all of the limpets are going to be eaten. Some of the limpets are going to be excreted afterwards. And some of the energy that the limpet takes in is going to be used for respiration, for movement, for chemical reactions. So it's literally just asking for these bits here. So please let me know if that's not clear. Um, I know I didn't have the whiteboard showing for some of it. So if there's any issues with that, let me know. Um, I will be running the Google Meet straight after this. So we can jump on there. So if you've got any particular questions, I'll put that in there. And you can come and have a chat. And we can go through it then as well. Uh, just to say, go back to that. One more. With this one, they've given us the numbers and they've given us a graph. So what you would have to do with this one, notice over here, it's a level three question rather than level two. So this is where your graph skills comes in. And everyone's going to be groaning now because I know most of you don't like graphs. But you're going to have to work out a scale that you can use. So we're going to need a scale. So I bring my mouse down to here so you can see. We're going to need a scale that goes up to at least 840. And down to 10. So we've got, let's have a look. We've got the middle here. 10, 20, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Um, that's fine. I would say that, in fact, I'd probably go each of these squares is 50. Now, can I? No, not on this screen. I'll do this for next time, I think. I'll actually, in fact, I'll tell you what I'll do. Let me copy this. Uh, 
and then go back to my whiteboard and let's just have a look at how we'll do this question there we go so hopefully you can all see that so i think what i would do if i was doing this question and i haven't looked at the mark scheme for this yet um i would go 100 200 Yeah, I mean, we could. I'm going to do the biomass on both sides. So I'm going to go uh, three, four, and that'd be 450. And I'm going to do the same going this way as well. So my first square on here, remember, is 940. Hang on, just go back to pen. That there. So 940, sorry, 840. So that means we're going to have 420 on each side. That's 450 there. So that second line is going to be 420. And that second line is there is going to be 420 as well. So if I put a rectangle in here now. That should be a square. That's 840 in total. If that's not clear, again, post it in the board, up, post it in the comments box now. And I'll go through it again. What I've done is I've set a scale. I've got 100, 200, 300, 400. Um, my bar size is 840 because this is my algae. Um, and I wanted half of this on each side of my line. So I've done a rectangle that's 420 on each side of that line. Okay. My next one's going to be 200. So I'm going to want to go 100 on each side of that. So let me put another rectangle in here. So that is my invertebrates. My small fish is 40, so I'm going to go 20 each side of the line. This is starting to get quite difficult to put in. So that's about there. I should really zoom in. And then my last one is going to try and be 5 each side of the line, which is that slightly above um, it would be easier in the exam to use a ruler and to zoom in a little bit on that one. So if I just label these, I've then got my small fish. And then I've got my large fish. But they wanted this done to scale. So it doesn't come up very often, but just be aware that this is something they could ask you to do. It's really important to practice graph skills. And we will be putting more on Google Classroom as we go through. Because actually the better your graph skills are... I think when we looked at last year, across all the six exams in GCSE, um, there was a whole grade difference that you could get just by being good at marks. So, uh, Sorry, by getting, being good at graphs on this one. So it's really well worth making sure that you're good at that. Just go through any other questions on there. I think we'll go through the rest of it next time round. Right, what I want to do is those of you that have been tuning in recently now I've been cutting the video shorter to about 45 minutes because then what I've been doing is putting the Google Classroom link so the Google Meet link into Google Classroom I'm going to jump on board so in a few minutes I'm going to post the link in Google Classroom so it won't be emailed out so look in the comments box where I posted today's link if you're not on Google Classroom, drop me an email in a moment and I'll email it out to you. But you need to get onto Google Classroom. Um, so I'll be on there for until about, probably till about 10 past 12. So if anyone's got any questions on the work we've done today or anything else to do with science that you've been doing or you're not sure about, jump onto Google Meet, come and say hello and we can go through it. Okay, it's been really good to see so many of you online today. So well done. So I'm going to stop the stream now. And I'll post that link in Google Classroom in about one to two minutes. Cheers, guys.